And thank you, Jürgen, Jürgen, and Anna, for inviting us and having us and being great hosts. We're super happy to be here in Berlin. Um, this whole project that we're going to talk about today started here at Typo Labs last year. And, um, you know, the basic of it is this idea of how we can use variable font technology to improve the current justification methods for typesetting Arabic. Um, but it's grown to be much more than that. And we wanted to talk about it here today because it's an ongoing project and we still have some issues that need resolving. So we'd be happy to hear any ideas and comments from you lovely people in the audience here. Um, the major part of our focus recently especially has been on the idea of justification. And as many of you probably know, justification can get really complicated, really fast, and a bit of a pain in the ass, really, so... So, uh, <laughs> one, once, once we started working on this, uh, around the midpoint, we were like almost thinking about using that strategy that shows up top, just giving up, because it was pretty complicated. Uh, but in the end, like, uh, we wanted to show really this, this uh, uh, strip to show that there, there's various different approaches to uh, f uh, full width justification, right? Uh, particularly in Latin, you can use things like letter spacing, hyphenation, or stretching. If you, if you want to get more creative, you can just put random crap in between the <laughs> sentences, like it says on that fourth one. Or if any, everything else fails, you can just go for snakes, right? Our preferred method. <laughs> so, well, that's our presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, uh, seriously, uh, Sahari is now going to explain a bit about uh, how this all works for the Arabic script. So, Sahari. Yeah. So, as those of you who were in Typo Labs last year might remember, I showed this slide during the final panel that um, used, it was probably somewhere here was moderating, and I was talking about how um, current types, uh, type technology doesn't really allow for nicely set Arabic text. And after this panel, I had a conversation with Peter Constable, and he asked this question of, and I think he was going in this direction, but he asked the question of, if you have any given space, can you then fill it in with the same sentence in Arabic? And I said, yes. And this is a clear example of what I'm talking about. In Arabic, you don't fill a line, you fill a space. And this is the same sentence. And you can see in the top part, it's just written in a, with all the short basic connections. And then in the two bottom lines, the line is becoming longer by adding in what is called kashidas, extensions in Arabic. And through this conversation, it sort of sparked the idea of okay, variable fonts, super cool. Maybe we can use it to actually solve a problem now. Can you use this one? That's easier. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, it became an idea of using variable fonts for setting kashidas, which is a kashida is what these elongations are called. Other names, MAD, Tatsvil, Unicode 0640. Yeah. So, what's a kashida? Um, a kashida is an extension of a part of a letter or a connection between two letters in Arabic. It's a very basic element that is used quite frequently when writing the script. And as I said before, there are two different kinds. So highlighted here is an example of when a kashida exists between, in a connection. So it actually doesn't exist as a separate unit on its own, but it's only um, so here, for example, the, on the right, you see the combination of the letter fe and dal. Yes. And it's a very short basic connection there. But then by adding what we call an acquired kashida in the middle, you can extend the connection and make it longer. And then the second kind is when you get a character itself changing. The core of the character actually changes here. So in a sin, which you see, it's the second character in the connection there, the three teeth actually become one long stroke, and that is what we call an inherent kashida. Just to make this a bit more clear, um, 
This is an example, again, of an acquired Kushida where the only thing changing here is the connection between the two. There's no extra character being added in the middle. And this is an inherent one where the part, part of the letter itself changes to make, uh, to make possible the elongation. Inherent Kishidas can be different across different styles, so you see the style names here on the right. Um, as you can see, if you look at the bottom example in Shakasta Nasali, they are a very common feature because it's a very rounded style, and whereas you get less of them perhaps in other styles. And there are also a lot of rules that go into where an acquired Kishida, which is the connections, can go, and current justification methods to some extent follow these rules of where you can, they can be used. So when and why do we actually use a Kishida? Um, the three biggest reasons for them are listed here, aesthetics, legibility, and justification. They're not mutually exclusive. All three of them can be used at the same time. So for instance, in this example, um, you see that in the middle you have a part that's being um, elongated and all three are applying at the same time to this Kushida. But just to go through them one by one, aesthetically, when you're writing poems, in Persian in particular, and you see this constant vertical rhythm going through the line, on the t this is, again, the same line repeated on the top and bottom. On the top, you get this very condensed black somehow. And then on the bottom, the Kashida is actually giving pause and giving you white space and giving your eye a rest before you go on to read the rest of the prose. And it also serves a double function. It's not just an aesthetic thing. It's also giving you an audible somehow cue. When I read this, I know that I am supposed to read that particular letter more stressed, give it a bit of a longer space as, acquired, as opposed to the other letters around it. So it serves as a double function. Examples of um, a Kashida being used aesthetically, this is in a mosque in Isfahan. The Thula style is being used for calligraphy here. It's a very vertical style. It has really long ascenders. So a Kashida here, which is spanning two huge walls, actually, breaks that, allows for a nice sort of placement of diacritic marks, so I found this quite a beautiful example. Um, this is a signature weaved into a carpet, um, a store sign, and another store sign. It becomes a very stylistic thing sometimes, this um, aesthetic feature of it. And a bit of a morbid example in a gravestone where it's used to make a very beautiful combination of the dead person's name. So, second reason is legibility. In the example I showed before and in the examples here, you have the letter sin as the first letter on the right. Sin is written with three teeth. Now, this can be followed by other letters that have one teeth, other three teeth. So, if you keep having these in a word like system in the top line, system, you end up with a lot of teeth and this can hinder legibility or reading speeds. So what's typically done here is the scene, the three teeth is taken and become one long stroke. So for instance, in the bottom example, you wouldn't read it basa on the right, you knew, you would know straight on that the first letter is a scene. So that's legibility and I really love this example. This is a, ice, the word ice cream in Persian is basani and you would normally get six more teeth than that, yeah? And here you only have to visually deal with two because the three uh, teeth have disappeared and become one long stroke. Another example here, and this is also um, a good example of how the Kishida is also being used for aesthetic purposes and uh, legibility and justification because in the bottom line there, um, the Kishida and the word basit is limiting the teeth, it's helping to justify the line with the one above it, and helping you with reading the poetry. So the final reason and uh, the final um, reason for using a Kishida, and the one that's probably the most important to us, is justification. So, um, 
This is poetry set in a typeface called Mirza, designed by Amir Mahdi and Muslehi. Um, it's one of the very few typefaces that allows you to properly use um, a kishida and justify things very nicely. In Persian, poetry, traditional style of poetry at least, works differently from Latin where you have a stanza, four or five lines, followed by a break, and then another stanza. It's, work, it's set in two columns, so two mirroring columns, and these columns are always perfectly justified in handwriting. And if you don't add a kushida, this is what it would look like, the bottom line. You would not get the same effect. You wouldn't be able to justify it without using a kushida. So it's actually very important. And poetry, for anyone that knows Persian culture, is a huge part of it. So this is actually a very important thing to be able to do this properly. So, more examples of justification. Um, that same poem written in a manuscript. Um, another manuscript example with the use of nastalik and kishidas to justify. A little prayer over an entrance where um, they're using a kishida to just some, somehow fit everything into that space that's been available. On the back of a truck. We particularly like this example and chased this truck for a bit to get the picture. Um, <laughs> And it was, it's a bit sad, it says, uh, crowded but lonely. <laughs> we are very dramatic people, I know. Um, but yeah, I quite like this example as well. Manhole covers and cookies, make whatever connection you will of that. Um, handwritten in uh, stores for spices and flowers that we steam and drink. And one very important use for a kushida is in maps. So this is an old map, it's from the Gajar era. Um, what you do when you have to fill a space in line is you space out the letters. In Arabic, when you have an ocean to cover, you use kashidas, and you extend it as much as possible. So on the right, you have a zooming in to show that there's a contracted version, and then in the oceans, you get these really nicely curved, long kashidas. So... Going back to this, um, all the examples I've shown so far have mostly been calligraphy and lettering. And in them, you've seen these kashidas that have been curved with a nice sort of organic form. What happens in almost 90% of typefaces, though, is what you see on the bottom line here. This is set in uh, Nazanin. The kashida, the curve, becomes a flat line. And even though this can be, to some justify this as a stylistic thing, when you look at Nazanin as a typeface, it's very rounded. The short connections are actually quite round. But then the kishida, when it's added in, it becomes a flat connection. And this is something that happens in type over and over again. And the reason is it's a leftover element from hot metal where you would use, here you can see a very clear example of it, just a bar that was simply would be stuck in to connect one letter to the next. Because it's the option that's available, it's become very widely used. You see it almost everywhere in countries that use the Arabic script. Um, these pictures are from a recent trip we went to Iran, and we started gathering as many examples as we could. So street signs, menus, newspapers, and here's an example of a modern-day map um, where you can see some funky things happening in Peru that's just been bent there, or the Alps that are doing a bit of a caterpillar move across the globe, and they're all from South America, which is someone's bias shining through a bit there. Because um, actually, I think when you live in a country where the Arabic script is used, you become used to seeing these, but for Jose, he was just constantly on his camera finding things because it's actually a very common thing. So, yeah, candy wrapper, where he was very happy to even see examples of it there. So, after all of this, <coughs> coming back to what we're working on now, was this idea of, okay, Variable fonts, cool, we can move through different weights and widths and all of these different axes very easily, but maybe let's try and start to solve issues with it. 
And one very good candidate for that, in my mind, was using variable widths for er, extending and making um, these nicely organic curved kishidas. So, because I will walk you through the uh, variable font side of things now. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, as, as Sahara mentioned, uh, this was the starting point. Uh, we, uh, Sahara just trying to figure out, okay, where can we apply this? What can, uh, how can we benefit from this technology and make things happen in a nice way? Uh, around, I guess, December last year, uh, this page on GitHub uh, uh, was open to access for everyone so that uh, people can uh, propose variable font access for different functionalities for what, whatever they see fit. So uh, what we tried to work towards was uh, being able to create uh, such a specification and create an axis that would allow us, allow us to uh, use variable fonts for justification in Arabic. So we came up with the, the proposal and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, eventually, if you want, like, we, we can point out where you can find all of this stuff. I'm not going to read from there. Uh, but just to explain roughly what this axis that we are proposing uh, is about, uh, it's basically an axis that allows you to modify the advanced width of a character uh, by changing just uh, one element of a letter. So it, it may sound similar to, for example, a width axis, right? Uh, so when you have a width axis in a font, uh, you don't only change the width of the glyph, you also compensate uh, for getting an even grade on the page, for example, so that it, when you set like a condensed with, with an extra, uh, with an extended, you get like similar uh, color on the page. You may make it a bit wider because you get more white space, right? Uh, or sorry, more heavy because you get more white space in between the letters and all that. Uh, so what we're proposing is slightly different in that it's not meant to change the whole core of the letter. It's not meant to change the weight. It's meant to change one single element that allows you to extend the advanced width and uh, thus change uh, how that glyph is uh, yeah, set on the page. Like it's going to be longer or shorter or whatever it is that you need. Uh, so let me show you s some of the things that we've thought about uh, we could use for this, uh, this axis could be used for. Uh, so I'm going to show some demos. Uh, so one of the obvious things, for example, uh, thinking in, in, in it for, for Latin, uh, is uh, if you have a script font that has swashes, well, why not just use, use it to extend the swashes, right? Uh, so you can see here, for, for example, the, both, both words are changing uh, wh where they start, and that's because the, the axis is changing, uh, so this axis is changing the advance width from the left side, let's say, uh, uh, and it's adding the, the width from the uh, swash on the left and then the swash on the right to, to finish the words. Um, sorry, I need, I need to try and pinpoint. Yeah, there we go. Uh, another example for, for, for other kinds of display fonts, uh, uh, taking, uh, we took uh, Bungie by David Jonathan Ross and, and we thought like, okay, so let's add a width axis, right? Uh, in a width axis, you change, for example, some, some aspects of like the, let, the letter A where you make it a bit wider. You may even make, uh, allow for a change in the angle of the, of the K so that you can uh, make it a bit wider. But then the idea behind the, the glyph extension axis is that it operates on top of any other axis that, that you're applying, right? So, for example, you can just say, oh, actually, I want to make this K a lot longer, so I just grab it and pull it out. And you can change other parts of the, of the letters as well. You can think of it in a different way than you would think the width axis. Uh, so let's say I have an L, and, and, and OK, so with the width axis, it's that wide. Maybe it doesn't need to fill in that space so much. But if I were to extend it more, maybe I can add a little terminal and then it becomes uh, a bit better filling in space and, and all that. So uh, the whole idea behind the axis is that it can operate on top of other things. Uh, one thing I want to mention here as well is that uh, because this is an axis that we, is meant for being applied at least sometimes in the per glyph individually, we're thinking, well, I mean, doing that with a slider is a pain in the ass. You need to select the letter and then move the slider and yeah, 
nobody wants to do that. So we were trying to think, how can we do this? Maybe it would be good to just interact directly with the character. So uh, Jenny Bellou uh, from Delta Mac helped us uh, come up with this and try, try to make it a, a demo uh, using web technologies, because it's the easier way nowadays. Uh, so you can just drag the, 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 yeah, the left, right side, in this case, of the characters to extend them. Uh, and that also kind of simplifies a lot the interaction in an access like this mm -hmm. between the user and the font. It makes it more tactile. It, it allows you very fine control. Oh, I want it just right there. It's, it's quite nice as an idea of how to interact with an access. Um, and then, I mean, I, I, we've shown right now a few examples that are very uh, kind of change things massively, but then you could potentially do some like minor changes to, give to, to a font where, uh, let's say, you have a condense here, you have a condense and, 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 and an extended axis. Uh, uh, sorry, extremes. Uh, but then with the glyph extension axis, let's say this is a bit too tight on the F and the R, maybe you can change slightly the terminal so that they fit a bit better, uh, and then it can apply on whatever way you want because it's applied across the condensed, but then when I, when I go for extending while applying the glyph extension axis, so there it's applied. Uh, in this case, for example, I made it so that uh, as it goes wider, it starts disappearing because I don't think it's needed at that, point, at that point. So now if I try to change the glyph extension axis, nothing changed. So uh, it, 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 I think it, it can potentially allow for a lot of refinement in what you're doing, uh, uh, and depending on the font you're using or that you're creating, uh, it can become uh, quite an interesting thing and a way to approach things. Uh, finally, and coming back to the, the thing that, uh, we're, it all, that started it all, uh, you can... We wanted to have demos that would work with Arabic, and this is the first demo that we, that we made with, uh, created for Arabic. Uh, this is also the first demo where, uh, that, that um, uh, thing where we can drag things that Jenny created. Uh, well, this is where it came from. Uh, and so, because it's important for Arabic to be able to control per glyph the extension, at least when you're using aesthetically, yeah. uh, we want it to be able to have that control, right? Uh, of course, uh, yeah, you can also apply it like this and, and whatnot, but th this is just like the first demo, and this demo kind of showed us that there were some other things that we assume may be easier, uh, mm -hmm. and it turns out they were not that easy. And so Sahar is gonna explain some of the things that were become a complication when trying to design uh, a single axis and an extension for a connecting script. Yeah. Um, so, when we started to think about how this glyph would apply in the design of an Arabic typeface, the most important thing to us was trying to come up with solutions that would, dis that would keep the design flow as it currently is as much as possible so designers wouldn't have to design in new ways. So we thought, okay, let's look at the current methods and see what we can do with those. So in the first instance, what I did for the design was I kept this idea of in the light blue line in the center, that's where the connection is happening, a connection being shared between two letters that are connecting. And this is what it looks like in its regular form. And then extended, I kept the connection mostly for one character, the, pre the one in the middle. As you can see, this quickly falls apart. The curve is wonky, it's unbalanced, and it doesn't look nice at all. And that's what it looked like in the connecting letter. So we quickly scrapped this idea and thought, OK, maybe there are better ways of doing this. So for the second example, again, you can see that it's still the same idea. The connection is still shared. But a majority of the connecting bit went to the first letter, the one in the middle here. And then when it extends, the bowl, the part that's sinking lower down the line and the curve, still goes to one letter most of the time and then goes back up to connect to the other letter. The problem with this is getting those curves right because you have to design them across separate masters, right? One is still in the regular, one is an extended. It's a pain in the ass to get these curves to match up and you can only eyeball it. There's no plug-in or anything to help you with these curves. So it was taking me a lot of time and 
we figured, okay, people aren't going to bother with this solution. So again, we scrapped it. And at this point, I was very frustrated, and I was telling Jose, okay, let's just keep it as it is, a connection that joins in the middle and is shared between the two glyphs equally. Yeah. So uh, what we thought about is, okay, so we, we were proposing one axis. What if we propose two axes or three? Uh, so what we came up with is that uh, letters would share 50-50 uh, the extension. So when you extend it, uh, the, the, the first letter on the extension shares 50, and then the other one it shares 50, but that means that you need two axes. You need one axis that extends this white glyph on the left side, and then you need another axis that extends this glyph on the other side. Mostly f because they're in Arabic, there's glyphs that go in, like, th there are medial forms, and that connect on both sides. So how do you tell it which side it needs to extend, right? So that's why we came up with, well, I said two axes, I said, I said three axes. There's also, in Arabic, letters that extend, but don't connect to anything. So those are, don't have a, a side. It's not extending on the left or on the right. Uh, we scrapped this idea because, first of all, there's still issues in the sense that you, you, you still need to be able to move certain parts of letters. Uh, the, deep, the, the longer the extension is, sometimes the deeper it needs to go down, but when you change the angle of or, and how, how down it goes, you need to change how it connects here, so you need to change this part of the letter as well. And it, it, it became a bit uh, complicated. It also meant you needed like, at least four masters. It also meant that if you were an implementer of a layout engine, you would need to be like f have very clear knowledge that if you don't extend both sides or both uh, axes, one, one half for one letter, one half for the other, uh, you would break the connections. Yeah. Or not break the connections, but they would look wonky. Yeah. So, we, um, well, we talked to um, Dennis, who works at Dalton Log at the skills team, and he suggested this idea of keeping the connection entirely in one character, and then the second character not even having a connecting part. And for me, when I hear as a designer something like that, my heart sinks because I instantly know that it means a lot of work. You never know what character it's going to connect to, so you need alternatives. But we thought, okay, it's an idea, let's rewire and rethink it and try this new method. So we did. And when this extends, what happens is, again, the second character remains exactly the same, and it doesn't have any ingoing connection, the uh, uh, outgoing connection. The only part that's connecting is the middle character. It allows for very nicely drawn curves. <laughs> Not that you should judge this on the design of it at all. This was just so we could have examples to show you here. Um, but it gives you very direct control over how you design a connection between any two given letters. And what I really like about it is it very much follows the same logic as you have in handwriting. When you're writing Arabic, you don't r write one letter, then the next, and then you write strokes, right? So if I'm writing, this is how the same logic that I would follow. So it made sense, and it was quite easy to use. And uh, maybe a better, clearer example of what I mean is here, where the doll, which would typically be designed the entire left part of this would be designed as a whole. What's happening instead is that the connection goes from the first character all the way to the top and finishes the stroke, and then when you type the second letter, the pink bit at the bottom gets added in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, as, as Sahar mentioned, it requires a lot of alternates. Uh, yeah. In total, I think she, she drew... Each of those colors is an alternate for each of the letters ten. that would uh, extend. So it's 10 alternates per the letters that extend, or that connect to the next one. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's quite impressive like, that she managed to do all of that in three weeks. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, and there's another thing that, that why, we, we, well, uh, why we decided to, to, to use this example uh, to try this, because it sounded complicated. It sounded, oh, we'll need a lot of alternates. So uh, what Sahar thought, was, let's try it with a slightly more complicated uh, style, yeah. which is more calligraphic, which is Tuluth, yeah. right? So here you can see like the two different, uh, like the, the normal width and the, the one where each character has the extension. Uh, 
Uh, now, this depends a lot on open type features for contextual substitution. Yeah. If you consider that uh, what, we, what we mentioned before, that ideally this would apply per glyph, it means that when you apply this axis, axis to one glyph, this is what happens. It breaks. It breaks the connection because it doesn't know what letter comes before or after because it's now a completely different font. That, that, that glyph that's extending is treated now as a different font. And there's no interaction between open type features between different fonts. So, yeah, that's a bit, a bit of a problem. A better way of explaining this is uh, this example that has been shown quite a bit, uh, I think, on Twitter and has been a part of a lot of discussions where you have uh, kerning working when it's a single style, but when you, add, uh, and when you go ahead and change uh, the style of one of the characters, it completely breaks the kerning on the right side. Uh, and yeah, this is a problem for us, for, for, for designers that want to do uh, this kind of interactions, but I, I think that it's also a problem in terms of expectations uh, for users, because the fact is, in most software, you can actually go ahead, select a glyph, and apply an axis to it, and it will break the kerning. But users don't know that, or, or, or will know it, or will only know once they do it and see, oh, this is changing in weird ways. So yeah. I think this is a bit problematic, and, 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 and I know that there's been some discussions about how to solve this. I, I, I mean, obviously, we had vested interest in that to, 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 because it's a big part of what we're proposing in the Axis, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's something I th that becomes very interesting and useful uh, the more you look into it, the more you see uh, different examples, not just on Latin, but on, uh, on other scripts as well. Uh, speaking about some of the other troubles that we found, uh, so Arabic is a connecting script, right? So when you have something like this happening, where on the, uh, around the blue area that I have, I have ha highlighted there, uh, you can see it's dis disconnecting. Uh, that's a problem. And I think I may understand why this is happening, but it baffled me for, for quite a while. Uh, so you have this character, right? And this character has an extreme point that's marked with the, like, uh, the little pink dot there. Uh, and this is the first master, so the narrower master. Uh, and you have a certain advanced width for the whole thing, and you have a certain width, right? But then when you extend it, uh, what happens is that the uh, extreme point uh, changes. Now, that in itself is not necessarily a problem. The problem is that in between, there's a shift between what is considered the, the, the extreme point and how the width of the outline is measured. And it's not, let's say, collinear with what happens in the metrics table in the interpolation between one master and the other, the width interpolation of, of the metrics table. So what happens, I think, is that, uh, well, yeah, that changes the the the, the, the full width of the character, and that breaks things. Uh, the, the way we solved it, at least in, for, for, for the, the examples that we've shown, is to add like a phantom node uh, far, far away where no other point on the glyph will reach it to all <laughs> characters on the, on, 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 on the font, and that allow, basically that acts as the new extreme point. It allows the, the interpolation for the, for, the, for the advanced widths and everything to, to just happen nicely and, and all that. Uh, that explanation sounds very weird, and I, 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 if somebody can explain it better than me, please, I, I would be glad, because it really, like, only until, like, three or four days ago, like, yeah. we were still kind of trying to make that work and kind of saying, what's happening? Are we building the fonts, the fonts wrong? Uh, and maybe it has to do with, like, what one should expect for uh, the interpolations between these two glyphs, but it's something that we didn't expect would happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, in any case, this is, uh, we've shown some examples on Latin, we've shown some, some examples on, 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 on Arabic. Uh, there, there can be other uses for it, so there can be uses for, for example, Syriac, which is also a connected script and also uses elongation for justification purposes. Uh, there's NCO as well, that uh, also uses extensions to, uh, I guess, in, in similar ways as Arabic. Uh, of course, we're not experts, so we don't entirely know. It would be great if anyone knows more, to, 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 if, they, if you can approach us and, and we can discuss about it. Yeah. Uh, we've, we asked around as well, and uh, Shani Abni uh, told us that uh, it has been used before in, in, in certain situations for Hebrew. Uh, uh, ob obviously, this is a manuscript, but... Uh, 
uh, I th she also mentioned that some, uh, some of the uh, newer type designers have also started adding it for uh, display uses. Stylistic. Yeah, yeah, stylistic display uses and stuff like that. And then uh, one that we didn't entirely know until we went on the trip, it's uh, um, Armenian handwritten reverse contrast uh, script. And then this seems to have elongations. We asked uh, Hajak Apelian about it, and he said, like, yeah, it seem, it, it's very likely to be that the case. Obviously, this is one very particular style of, 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 of a script, but yeah. it shows that there are uses for it other than what we've shown already. Uh, and it's very, it would be very interesting to, to know if, if somebody, some of you can also come up with other examples or, th or, or you think that this may apply or be useful for, for you. Uh, Thinking about uh, back into justification, but not for Arabic, uh, watching Bram Stein's presentation at Robothon, uh, we think this could actually apply very well. Uh, this, uh, what he showed could, apply, could be applied very well with our axis. So uh, if, you, if you watch the, his, his presentation, what he's talking about is how to use variable fonts for justification in Latin, and specifically how to use it to change very slightly the, the, the width of certain letters per line and uh, uh, make the justification better. So he's showing here, uh, uh, based on a model by, by uh, Nuth and Plas, uh, which treats each line and gives it a badness uh, score. So uh, what you try to solve with, uh, with using uh, through justification and what you uh, are trying to do is get the lines to be the least bad possible. So here you can see some lines, for example, where it's, it says shown in her face. Uh, there's a, a quite a long red bar there, and you can see that there's quite big spaces there. That's a level of, that, that counts as badness, right? You, you don't want, you want it to be a bit more even. So what he showed is that using uh, variable fonts, you can change the width of the letter only slightly. And since it's a lot of letters per line, it, the, the sum of those changes compounds and it makes it uh, something that allows you to make it uh, use less the, the, the inter-word inter space, yeah. uh, which is a good thing, and it makes the text a bit more even. Uh, so we think it, the, the access could, uh, could help very well there, because if you want to change the width, you don't want to change the weight necessarily, because yeah. otherwise that may change the texture of the uh, lines a bit too much. Um, in any case, going back to Arabic, uh, you have the same parameters. Uh, you have the space, right, and you can change the inter-word space. Uh, but, of course, in, it's inherent in the Arabic script that you can use uh, the kashidas to change widths, right? So, um, that's a cool thing, and that's what we were aiming for. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's other issues. Uh, we, we, we took this from uh, a presentation that John did. Uh, uh, this is basically uh, the, the steps, roughly the steps that uh, uh, how a, a text is shaped, right? And uh, how you get the final result. Uh, and as you can see, the, the f you have a whole bunch of things before you go to justification. Justification is literally the last thing in the list. Uh, and that becomes a bit problematic because sometimes if you're doing justification, you may want to change uh, uh, stylistically some other thing or contextually some other thing. The fact is you don't have uh, open type features available anymore because they've already been processed. So th there, are, there are a few things there that, be that uh, uh, would need some rehashing perhaps on, 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 on current platforms. Uh, what we can say is that in current open type implementations of uh, uh, Arabic justification, uh, there's a few things that are done quite well. I, you can manually insert the kashidas even through the keyboard, which is very nice in terms of user interface. The same place where you're typing, you can add the extension. Mm. Uh, there's, at least on certain platform, basic kashid insertion rules. Uh, it works within current specification because it can be used, uh, and it has somewhat some control over the kashid lens depending on the software. Uh, Limitations is what Sahar has already said, only straight kashidas. Uh, the lengths, at least on some, on some of the implementations, are limited by steps, so you have like uh, short, medium, or long, and then that's all you, you, you can get. Uh, it's 
the justification itself tends to be too dependent on interword spacing, which breaks the evenness of the text. Uh, it doesn't account for style variation. So different Arabic styles uh, use different justification methods. Mm -hmm. So as Sahar said, like, uh, uh, some scripts uh, have different letters that will extend, so you need to take that into account. Uh, but then some other scripts just don't use kashiras whatsoever. Like so some, Ruka. some styles yeah. like Ruka. Uh, there's even language variation uh, where s some styles use hyphenation and, no and nothing else. So that, that's, that's, that becomes uh, quite problematic when you try to implement this on, on the layout engine. And of course, there's variance across implementation, so each platform does whatever, roughly whatever they, 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 they want. I mean, or they can. Uh, of course, th there are similarities, but the fact is a user won't get the same result necessarily uh, if they're using one piece of software or another, yeah. or even one browser or another. Uh, so what we think is uh, we'd like to leave some thoughts in terms of points to consider for potential future implementations. Yeah. Uh, of course, we would like it to take advantage of variable font technology. Yeah. Uh, we would like it to have programmatic and manual application of Kashidas, so that programmatically you can uh, have the layered engine justifying the text and use the Kashidas for that, or uh, manually the user just inserting a Kashida and changing the, 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 the width of it. Uh, as we mentioned, we currently have trouble uh, inserting an, or changing the axis on one single glyph in a word, for example. So ideally, these implement, <coughs> future implementations would allow for that. Uh, it would have knowledge of per style justification rules, how to tell it which style, you're, which style of font you're using. Well, that becomes a bit more problematic. Um, it accounts for alternate forms and ligatures, which are other things that can change the width. And then finally, it allows for the control of the, of the Kashida, for length of the Kashida, controlling the length of the Kashida, sorry. Uh, both on whole text, as if you were to like, make the whole text have a lot of very long Kashidas, automatically, kind of, or for it to change all the Kashidas that are happening in the text, or per word, or per instance of a Kashida. Uh, so in any case, finally, like, to quote John once more, <laughs> uh, uh, he's right. I mean, th there's still a few things that are, 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 are not entirely uh, completely defined within the, 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 the uh, vari vari variable font uh, specification. There are certain things that maybe uh, were assumptions that perhaps not everyone has, and it becomes problematic when not everyone knows what to expect or uh, comes up with surprises. And so, uh, yeah, all we can do is try to think about what we may want to have in the end and then try and see if we can come up with a proof of concept. So that's what we did. Like uh, the last thing that we're going to show is uh, us trying to do at least part of the justification process, right? So here's the last font that uh, uh, we showed uh, yeah. when Sahar was showing the the different strategies that we tried for designing this. And uh, let me get rid of the all, all, well. The colors are not showing quite well, uh, sadly. But yeah. okay, so. Here you can see that there's some uh, Kashidas there and some extensions. If I go ahead and grab the window, you'll see that some of those Kashidas are going to start changing, right? Yeah. Um, so this is essentially what we want, at least partly. Uh, let me put the background again. Uh, you can see that uh, in red are all the letters that have ex uh, elongations or extensions. And as, as I go, I can change that, right? And then I can do one other thing. I can, for example, grab again a handle and extend it, and that will reassess uh, all the spacing on the line, and it may even change some kashidas that I haven't touched yeah. to adjust for that increase of width. Um, of course, this, this is uh, uh, lacking a lot of things. The kashidas that are inserted are hard-coded right now. Uh, we don't have a, a, a way of implementing that right now, like saying, oh, OK, so if you have a line and you have a, this amount of words, uh, put the Kashida in the second to last word and uh, the third word or something like that. We don't have a way of doing that right now. Uh, but uh, this is what we, what we managed to do uh, for this, and this is our final demo. And again, thanks to Jenny for uh, uh, helping yeah. us with this. Like he, he was invaluable <laughs> in coming up with a Doing solution, an and job. he wrote 
uh, pretty much all of the uh, JavaScript code for allowing us to justify things. Here, we hijacked basically the whole engine, and we're not even using the browser justification method. Uh, he did his own and then uh, applied it. Uh, and, and since the what he had, he had knowledge of what the phone was doing, yeah, it, it, like he, he could come up with this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let me go back to the keynote, and that's it. Thank you Thank very you. much.